This is a Relay Project. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. Well, on this Monday, May 1st, we welcome you to Real Talk. Not just any ordinary episode of this show, although there's no such thing, is there, John Hicks? Our intrepid technical producer. Oh, of course not. There's no such thing as an average, <laughs> ordinary episode of Real Talk. But, of course, this is a big day for anybody that pays attention to politics in Canada, in particular the province of Alberta, as it's expected that Premier Danielle Smith, well, for starters, we're going to stop referring to her as Premier Danielle Smith for about the next 28 days or so. She will be UCP leader Danielle Smith after she goes to the lieutenant governor and uh basically uh, sets the wheels in motion. Albertans will go to the polls. It's expected. We keep saying that it's May 29th. But of course, if you're listening to this episode a little bit later in the day or even a little bit later in the week, then you know it's already happening. We have you covered today with an Alberta politics super episode, and that's going to continue on that trend through this week and, of course, through this month. It'll start with political scientist Dr. Jared Wesley with me in studio in just a second. Dr. Dwayne Bratt will also join today. We're going to talk to former Calgary councillor. He wanted to be mayor, Jeremy Farkas. We're going to get the down low, his take on Calgary's new arena deal. And of course, we're going to wrap today's episode with our Monday tradition. We love this. The book end at the beginning of the week, the Titan of Talk, Charles Adler will join us. We're going to get into some of the early storylines in this Alberta election. This episode of Real Talk is presented by the team at Danatech. We're talking safety and security today, in particular training. And Danatech is your partner of choice for all your health and safety training needs. Wanted to let you know, Real Talkers, if you're lucky enough to be out in the mountains this week, Team Danatech is going to be at the Energy Safety Conference in Banff starting on Tuesday. That's tomorrow. So if you're in the area, swing by Booth 48, say hi to their team, and enter their prize draw. Bigger picture, you can learn more about Canada's best safety training done right at danatech.com. So it's election season in Alberta. Of course, we've been treating it like that for the past few weeks, but now it's official and we're going to talk about it and we're going to talk about what this election means, what it's all about. What are some of the storylines that will dictate exactly how this is going to play out? Will the United Conservatives hold government or will the NDP take it back? It's Danielle Smith and her team versus Rachel Notley and her team Keeping an eye on all of it is political scientist out of the University of Alberta and a good friend of this show, Dr. Jared Wesley, who joins me in studio. It's nice to have you here on this Monday. Thanks for making time for us. Great to be here. Yeah, it's kind of funny. You and I have spoken for years. We've talked a whole bunch of times. And this morning, we shook hands for the very first time. There's nothing like being in person. <laughs> right? It's great. And you guys got great digs here. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. nice to have you here in studio. Now, this is, uh, for all intents and purposes, going to be the last interview that you're going to do uh, for the next month or so. How come? How do, how do you approach your job, and, and why do you step out of the spotlight from a commentary standpoint uh, when an election is underway? Yeah, uh, in, in a typical campaign, some of us that have more of a public-facing role in, in political science uh, can do upwards of, of 100, 200 interviews during a campaign just trying to provide some expert advice to journalists about what, what to expect, some background on rules and so on. But this campaign, uh, my research team at Common Ground is going to be in the field with a campaign period survey. So those are actually pretty rare for provincial politics, especially here uh, in Alberta, but elsewhere, where we're actually going to be in the field while the votes are being cast. And as a political scientist, I don't think it's it's my place to be commenting publicly on something that I'm studying. It's called the researcher effect, right? Um, and also, I just we just don't want any kind of perception that our public commentary is meant to sway our research. All right, so your, your personal microphone shuts off as soon as you walk out of this studio. We're grateful to have your commentary. Why don't we talk? I mean, we're going to get four different angles today on this episode. I should mention tomorrow, uh, Erica Baroudis and Cheryl Oates are going to go head-to-head. Uh, both have held senior leadership positions in Premier Daniel Smith and 
Premier Rachel Notley's offices, respectively, and we're, we're expecting what will be a good and, of course, a, a very partisan debate tomorrow. And that's, to be honest with you, as a watcher and a commentator, part of the beauty of an election campaign from, from, from a, a partisan standpoint or, or from a, a, an investigation into how partisan this is, how Albertans are wired right now, what some of the X factors will be in the election and what's going to sway voters. What are you keeping an eye on right now? Well, there are two parts to any campaign. Um, the first is what we call the air campaign. That's being fought over radio, podcasts, uh, being seen by most people sometimes on their Facebook feed or Twitter feed and so on. Those are the grand narratives that kind of carry a campaign. For the UCP, they want to make this election all about uh, the economy, jobs again, um, and the New Democrats, again, will try to make this the narrative about the campaign be about leadership trust. Um, I think uh, Rachel Nutley said boring government is what mm. she's campaigning on this time. Um, and uh, in healthcare, right? Healthcare and education, which are theirs. So that's the air campaign. That's what I'll be watching to see whether, uh, you know, each campaign is able to stay on message and talk about the issues that they know Albertans trust them most to handle. The second piece, though, is the ground campaign. And in close campaigns like the one, like this one, a uh, hundred votes could not only decide who wins a particular riding, but who forms government. Mm -hmm. And it'll be a real test, I think, to see whether the the NDP has the ground game they claim they do in Calgary. Uh, we saw all kinds of stuff on social media yesterday about their sign campaign and their sign blitz. We've seen evidence that donations out of Calgary have, have skyrocketed for, for that party over the course of the last, uh, last three years. And that's kind of an indication that they may have their ground game together. And the big question mark for me is whether the UCP has spent enough time trying to build out build out their base as opposed to being locked in these leadership reviews and leadership selection processes that tend to focus on who are already committed mm -hmm. conservative supporters because it's really going to matter who gets their vote out in this election a big part of building out a base to state the obvious as well is is convincing kind of the the middle of the road kind of the average voter the one that's not highly partisan the one the one that doesn't already have the lawn signs up the one that doesn't already have the bumper stickers on their vehicle convincing them that that you're the party or that you're the leader that can be trusted to run that government and to to plot or to chart the course of the province for the next four years right and and, and today we'll spend some time talking about some of the liabilities i mean it's it's no secret if people are really closely paying attention uh to what's going on in particular in danielle smith's orbit right now you know so, some photos have surfaced one in particular with a convoy organizer james botter it's 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 a it's another uh addition to that storyline that, that the premier is is entertaining and 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 certainly considering the opinions of valuing the contributions or the, the these partnerships or these friendships with people tied to the convoy her team says that's bs her team says she can't know Know possibly everybody she's being photographed with. We've got another candidate, uh, Chelsea Petrovic, of course, from a few weeks ago, mm -hmm. talking about heart attack survivors taking more accountability, personal accountability. We talked about a lot on the show. Kind of a, a curious post this weekend referencing social media posts that have yet to surface, mm -hmm. uh, which is, has caught a lot of people's attention. And, and I will say this to her uh, or about this situation. She's not the only one, me included, that would obviously say, hey, there's probably some stuff out there from years ago before we were considering being in the public eye that I'm not proud about now. But what's she getting ahead of? That's a storyline people are paying attention to. So so, so this is stuff, of course, that's going to form and shape people's opinions mm -hmm. on who ultimately earns that big deal, which is the check on that ballot. Yeah, I mean, from from a strategic standpoint, those, those other issues that you – it's not just what you want to talk about during a campaign – just as important that you're not talking about things you don't want to talk about yeah. and those kinds of counter narratives that the UCP is is out of touch they're only in it for for a small group of people have been you know ruminating for the last two or three years right and and the NDP I think has picked up on that and is trying to emphasize that message um, we can expect to see on among all parties some what we call bozo eruptions right o over the course of a campaign where somebody's past comments come back uh, come back to light and the party leader has to weigh in the candidate themselves has, has to weigh in um, and each one of those is it'll be interesting to see how the parties handle those because if you remember uh, let's just take the case study of 2012 Danielle Smith, you tried to handle a bozo eruption, and, and we know the lake of fire comments and so on from one of her candidates uh, took over that campaign, really derailed their messaging for the rest of the campaign compared to Jason Kenney in 20, 2019, where they had a series of three or four early in the campaign, but you notice how they pivoted back. They actually had a, if you remember this, a template apology letter 
that the party would send out to media immediately after a, a bozo eruption happened. And at the bottom was, was key. At the bottom, it always said, but we're focused on what really matters to Albertans, the economy, jobs, and pipelines. Yeah. Right? So this is what I'm going to be watching for is can campaigns pivot back to their main messaging or are they going to get stuck in the mud? Yeah. I, I think of, I think of uh, you know, former, uh, well, soon to be former MLA Thomas Dang as an example of a, of a liability on the NDP side. I mean, essentially, or do I have to say allegedly at this point, maybe I will allegedly try to hack Alberta Health Service and health records and it was something that you knew had the potential to really impact the NDP not in a good way and so he will not be seeking re-election but you do wonder it's a bit of a guilty wondering I can't help but wonder who's holding what on whom mm -hmm. and when those bombs are going to start to drop pretty soon and over the next few weeks we're going to see it you write in, in your Substack. you talk about common ground and you've just talked about this on the show before. And I want to let our, our audience members know that all the links to all the columns and pieces and research we'll talk about here. We'll link to those in the show notes on YouTube and the podcast, but you can check it out at cground.substack.com. Uh, you write uh, just about a week ago, uh, you described this, what's coming up right now as the most hotly contested election in Alberta's history. Uh, now, I don't know if if 2019 was hotly contested, it was, to be quite frank, uh, somewhat of a dominant performance by Jason Kennedy's United Conservatives. First time in Alberta, a party ever earned a million votes, but it, but it, but it was a very polarized fight, right? It was like you're with us or you're against us, you're blue or you're orange. Mm -hmm. How does 2023 most differ uh, from 2019? I mean, aside from a change in leadership with the Conservatives, and what is your research telling you? What's catching your interest? Yeah, so th this is most hotly contested, not just because the two parties are are diametrically opposed on ideology, but they're so close together. I mean, there's no poll, reputable poll out there that doesn't have them within within the the margin of error, right? 46, 45, and so on. So it's, it is it is tightly contested that way. Um, I think this campaign is, is a lot different than previous ones, and, and Eric Grenier on The Writ had, had, had a good column about this um, recently too, and he talked about how, it's, how rare it is to see two... Uh, two premiers, right, contesting an election against one another. The last time we saw that was back in the 1980s in, in Quebec, where Robert Bourassa came back uh, and, and contested that election. So what's really weird for me is that um, for the first time in Alberta history, we actually have two premiers with records that will be running against one another. Usually one of them is able to, to scaremonger and say, here's what, here's what you can expect. Yes. Well, no. Here's, here's what they did, <laughs> right? Um, so yeah, I think in, in that way, it's a really unique campaign. Um, and yeah, I mean, if, if Rachel Notley wins, just to follow up on that one, if Rachel Notley does win, she'd become the first uh, woman to ever repeat as premier, to ever win two wow. elections. No woman in Canadian history at the pre as a premier or prime minister has ever won two majorities or two elections. At, whether they're together or not we have guests on this show it's kind of part of the point of what we do that oftentimes will light a fire under the audience and one of those that certainly qualifies is a well, former calgary sun columnist Leisha corbella uh, she was on the show a while ago a couple of weeks ago talking about how she does not believe essentially uh, in any context that Rachel Notley can run on her record as premier. People can, can check out that interview in our archives. Pissed off a lot of people, quite frankly. But it does beg the question. I mean, who will be referencing Rachel Notley's record as premier more frequently? Her or Daniel Smith? <laughs> That's a very good question. Let's watch for that, too. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I just—I forget which it was a diplomat I was watching last night. And there was a line in, the, in that in that show that was quite instructive. Such a good said, show, by the way. It is great. It's a great show. Uh, it said, "Please compare me to the uh, please compare me to the alternative, not to the Almighty." Huh. And I think if the New Democrats are going to talk about their record, it's going to be contrasting it to to Daniel Smith's, and likely vice versa. Right. You've written a piece in The Conversation. Uh, people can check it out. Theconversation.com. Again, the link in the show notes where where. The headline doesn't mess around. Democracy itself is on the ballot in Alberta's upcoming election. Take us into it. Yeah, and we hear a lot of hyperbole every election from pundits and from candidates and leaders that this is the most important election uh, in, in the history of our province and so on. Um, I don't go quite that far, but I would say it is very unique in that we have a, a party in government that um, has played fast and loose with the Constitution and the rule of law to the point where policy debates are really kind of secondary, right? Um, we have a, a party that has uh, attempted to consolidate power in the premier's office to an extent we have never seen in this province, really since the 1930s. 
Um, you know, we know, I guess a lot of people know the story, but it's kind of like boiling a frog when you're in the water and it's slowly, you know, becoming hotter and hotter we tend to, to forget about everything that's going on around us and what's happened before. And in the piece and the conversation, I try to lay that out for folks. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a case where we have a party that was trying to, uh, replace the leadership of key agencies, boards, and commissions, including Alberta health services and post-secondary institutions and, co and consolidate control over all of those sectors in, in the hands of the premier's office. We all know, or maybe some people have forgotten about the Sovereignty Act 1.0 that tried to steal power from the federal government, from the courts, and from the Alberta legislature, and again, house those within the Premier's office. Um, there's, there's all of that, which is anti-democratic, and as Ken Bosenkul and I make the case, actually anti-conservative in a lot of ways. But it's the rule of law piece that I think Albertans probably understand more fundamentally, because it's not some abstract parliamentary tradition or institution it's this notion that people that know the premier seem to get special treatment and the Pulaski call is certainly a, a one indication of that but she's had ministers um, in, in the past that have have taken advantage of their position to either in the case of minister Shandro obtain phone numbers uh, from uh, of doctors and show up on their on their driveway and, and, and he's facing professional misconduct allegations because of that we all know the attorney general at the time called up the chief of police to, uh, you know, to talk about a traffic ticket. Um, and earlier on, it's not just it's not just the the Smith government, but the Kenny government was also um, Im embroiled in a lot of these firing the election commissioner before they can, can complete, you know, an investigation into the 20, 2018 UCP leadership race. So I think a lot of Albertans could be forgiven for 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 forgetting about all of this stuff, which is one of the reasons why I wrote the piece. But, but they shouldn't, right? This, this is a clear record that if the UCP is returned, they will view it as a mandate to continue things as usual, to continue consolidating power in the Premier's office and to continue uh, playing, flat, playing fast and loose with the rule of law. Yeah, 100%. This is, but, but, that, but that's the thing is like ultimately the, the ground game of politics or the, 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 the whole entire point is you know the strategy around it is what can you get away with and what can't you right mm -hmm. i mean i'm gonna you know i've been taking a lot of look at, at sort of you know th this uh this trend toward how we do politics yep. now and we have a lot of conversations about that on the show and when it comes down to it like it or not a lot of people believe that so long as it's their party mm -hmm. doing whatever it takes to win then they're okay with it Right? right. You know what I'm saying? Like, like for a lot of people, they'll look at this. I mean, you write in the piece, conversation, the conversation com. One thing is clear, writes uh, Dr. Jared Wesley, our guest in studio, uh, mired in multiple ongoing investigations into prosecutorial inter inter uh, interference and professional misconduct in the party's inaugural leadership race. You know, the United Conservative Party's actions indicate it considers itself above the law and beyond reproach. You continue the sheer volume of misdeeds is shocking. And Albertans shouldn't be lulled into thinking that it's politics as usual. Just because many of these episodes happen in plain sight in front of cameras and microphones doesn't make them any less egregious. I guarantee you that a lot of people that will read that will go, yeah, but I'm not going to vote for Rachel Ali, so, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's really not going to make that much of a resonation. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Uh, what does that tell you about the state of politics in Alberta right now? What's your message to Albertans that are acknowledging uh, or encountering that reality in their own circles? Yeah, I, I think the, the proportion of Albertans that are more worried about this stuff um, is, is much higher than the people that will just brush it off and say this is either politics as usual or, yeah, but the alternative is far worse, right? We actually have some, um, some recent uh, research out on our Seaground substack that, that talks about how these what some people call tribal tendencies. I prefer the term factional because of uh, connotations with, uh, with colonialism and so on. But this notion that people feel like their party should win all the time, that their party should get to set the rules, that their party should refuse to concede defeat if they think that they've won and the election authorities tell them. The number of people that actually answer in a factionalist way, in a tribalistic way, is actually much smaller than what we'd think. I think most Albertans are swayed by these particular uh, by these particular arguments, and it's why a lot of conservatives, small C conservatives, are having a very tough time uh, making up their mind in this campaign. Because you're right, the the reaction, the immediate reaction is, well, I can never vote New Democrat. Uh, whenever I meet somebody, I go, well, what, why, why is that? And I say that, by the way, Ryan, I say the same thing 
with conserv with uh, with New Democrats. In other words, you're not campaigning would, for the no. NDP. Well, I'm not, but I but I also ask people who use the hashtag never conservative, really never, because that absolutist thinking that all New Democrats are this way or all conservatives are that way is just not borne out by by our research. In that in that piece on on Substack and uh, on our Common Ground Substack, we talk about how um, most Albertans are multiple identifiers. Right? So we asked them, check, check all of these boxes that apply to you. Which of these following labels applies to you? We had conservative, moderate, progressive, socialist, libertarian, and so on, all the way down the list. Do you know what the most popular, the most popular label was? Mm. Moderate. 54% mm. of Albertans identify as moderate, followed by 44% who identify as conservatives, 43% who identify as progressive, wow. one point below. And if, if you take a look at who checked multiple boxes, over 80% of the Alberta electorate consider themselves to be both progressive and conservative. So this notion that Albertans are polarized uh, is just simply not borne out by the public opinion research. The parties are trying to, and this is, this is their, their, their bag, right? This is their game, to try to divide us into one camp or the other, either with us or you're against us. But most Albertans feel a, a lot of discomfort about that. Well, you don't have to look too far back to, to, to think of a time or to know of a time in Alberta where people faced with the choices uh, between progressive and conservative wouldn't have known which one to pick. Mm -hmm. I mean, the party that held government for more than four decades quite successfully uh, integrated both sort of ideologies, at least into the name and the brand. Mm -hmm. And while there was prob probably room for improvement in some of those areas, generally speaking, Albertans weren't forced to choose. And now they are. And it puts a lot of people in a conundrum. But 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 these are the votes up for grabs right now, right? right? I mean, there's people that are always going to vote orange. There's people that are always going to vote blue. Right now, the campaigns are going to be targeting the others. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, the, 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 the last, the, the, during that 40 years you talked about where people identified as both progressive and conservative looking for a progressive conservative option. It's important to note as Ken Bozenkuhl and I wrote in our piece in the line this week that um, it's not ide ideological conservatism, right? So the Albertans have never really been, you know, reading Ayn Rand to go to go to sleep at night. All right. Albertans have always had, as Ken puts it, a conservative disposition. What does that mean? That means that they like um, the, the, you know, things that are tested and true, slow progress, incremental change. They don't like sudden change. And so that's the conservative part that's kind of built into Alberta's political culture. But for, for everything else, they seem to be fairly progressive. Our research shows that if you ask them a series of value statements, you know, that pit large government versus uh, small government, they usually end up on the large government side, for example. So Albertans have, have I, I wouldn't call it an identity crisis. They've come to terms with it. They like, um, you know, s steady, uh, progressive change, but not too quick. For people that don't know who Ken Bosenkul is, I mean, a longtime conservative strategist and company staffer. I mean, he's done a ton of stuff. Uh, people probably would recognize his name as among those that penned the so-called firewall letter back in the day. So when you've got a guy that's signed his name next to Ted Morton and Stephen Harper and all the others that, that signed that document that I think has is, is shaped or at least contributed to the ideology of a lot of Alberta conservatives uh, over the years, uh, asserting now in this piece that you co-author that, quote, Quote, Danielle Smith is not a conservative. That's a pretty big deal. I mean, it's one thing for you to say it, and you know there's no disrespect at all, but you know what I'm saying. For Ken Bozenkuhl mm -hmm. to go around and say that an Alberta premier that, that fancies, I think, that sort of libertarian idea, that fancies those, like, to, to assert that she is not a conservative is a big deal. Yeah, I think you'd be surprised about my political leanings, actually. <laughs> Might I be? I and think, I don't mean to pigeonhole no, you. Think, I'm just saying no, but, I don't perceive you to be as... Yeah. Uh, Ken, Ken doesn't, uh, doesn't deny where no. his allegiances lie, no. ever. No. You, you're a little more careful with it. Yeah, well, I'm a little bit more careful. I think it, it, it is instructive, though, to take a look at those of us that have stuck our necks out and those of us with privilege and, and positions like I do... Uh, with tenure, for example, at university, I can speak out in a way a lot of my colleagues can't, but they tell me behind the scenes, oh, thank you for doing that sure. so I didn't have to do it. But I think, you know, folks coming out and criticizing the UCP are automatically labeled as progressive or automatically labeled as being partisan for the New Democrats or, and so on. It's just simply not 
accurate. Um, I can uh, uh, maybe that's another show where I can maybe pull up a couch and I can sit here and give you my my political leanings. But they're certainly not where a lot of, of United Conservatives seem to want to place them on. There's no way that I want to blow past an opportunity, though, to invite <laughs> you to come out as a card carrying, you know, capital C conservative. I mean, if you want, if you can you can check my disclosure page. I've only ever been the member of one political party. Which is it? Well, two two political parties from yeah. the same family. Really? Yeah. You want to you get into it it's for people that don't mm-hmm. want to do the research? I, I I've I've studied United Conservative and Progressive Conservative campaigns. Yeah. I've been a member of both of both both of those parties. Wow. I'm not currently. Yeah. But I participated in those elections because back then, as you know, choosing. Uh, choosing the, that leader is choosing the premier. A hundred percent. But but I didn't I didn't have some kind of existential moral crisis by by signing up to take out a, a progressive conservative and even a UCP card. I, I would now. Yeah. But huh. Before I let you go, and, and I promise to only keep you for a certain period of time, you've got to, again, shut off your microphone and, and go essentially radio silent for the next month. Uh, we're going to be talking to former... Calgary Councilor, former candidate for mayor, Jeremy Farkas, next. Mm -hmm. Um, And we're going to talk about this arena deal, which is going to be, obviously, uh, a huge part of the conversation around this election campaign and whether or not it's a good deal and what it means for Calgary. And and quite frankly, from a a political uh, analysis standpoint, is it going to work, right? The the premier right now, Daniel Smith, is telling people, if you want this deal to go through, it's got to be with us. That's the way she's doing it. Uh, general observations or maybe a key storyline that you're keeping an eye on with regards to this Calgary arena deal? Yeah, first, I'm not convinced either campaign wants to make this an election issue. <laughs> I think the UCP might have thought that until the public blowback. Um, and I, I'm not sure the New Democrats, I think the New Democrats messaging on this was, was um, uh, vague and clear at the same time they that they don't too. want, they don't, they don't want to touch it. Um, and I think from a political strategy standpoint, though, I'm not sure um, who this arena deal appeals to in Calgary and whether they're in that subset of voters that are swing voters. So we know from previous research and other arena deals in Canada and even in the United States that um, that women in particular are indifferent at best or opposed at worst um, to these kinds of investments in 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 arenas. Um, yeah. And so I, I'm not sure this is a vote getter. Uh, I'm not I'm not sure that that this issue is actually going to sway the campaign. But I think it is important that now that the premier's landed it on the the agenda. It is important for people to debate it. Uh, Dr. Jared Wesley, political scientist out of the U of A. Uh, check our show notes for links to all of the columns that we've talked about. Want to uh, thank you for making Real Talk your final interview uh, before you go radio silent. We'll talk to you again in a month. How does that sound? Anytime. All right, my man. Right. Thanks a lot. We appreciate it. That's Dr. Jared Wesley. Uh, that conversation is presented by Real Talk sponsors like Nate's J.R. Shaw School of Business. Do you have dreams to build the next innovative product or solve a world problem or maybe you want to lead change grow community or transform business then nate's jr shaw school of business is your answer as one of canada's leading polytechnic business educators they'll harness your inner talent build your skills and feed your curiosity your future will be brighter because of their immersive style of learning and deep relationships with industry graduate with the in-demand skills that future employers are looking for. You can learn more by checking out the J.R. Shaw School of Business at nate.ca. It's always so nice to have somebody join us in studio, John, isn't it? Like Dr. Wesley, and the first thing he says when he walks in the door, he goes, nice digs. We love friends, and we love friends who give us compliments. (laughs) We're always happy to accept compliments on behalf of the amazing work of the team at Complete Care Restoration. They're the ones that deserve the credit for how this studio looks. They're the ones that took the plans from our designers and brought them into a, I don't know, a state that we just could barely believe they exceeded our expectations. And their commitment to detail with us through the process was really remarkable. It gives us the confidence to recommend them unreservedly. Uh, CompleteCareRestoration.ca is where you can learn more. They also help people out in nightmare situations like fires and floods and asbestos and black mold and all the gnarly stuff. Again, you can give them a call at 780-454-0776. Hey, John, we're proud to be partnering with the amazing team at Northwest Fest again, and it's sneaking up on us. You know, it kicks off May 4th through the 12th with the Rainbow Visions Film Festival screening back-to-back from May 12th 
through 14th. That's the first time ever that Northwest Fest International Documentary Festival's partnered with Rainbow Visions. You can check out their full lineup and individual tickets for all films at northwestfest.ca. This is at Edmonton's famed Metro Cinema. This is just south of the High Level Bridge. It's an absolutely iconic location. And there are a ton of highlights here to talk about. We're going to bring you up to speed in the next couple of weeks, including some of the hottest films straight from South by Southwest, Sundance, and Hot Docs, including opening night, a biggie from Apple Original Films. It's still... That's right, that's the Michael J. Fox movie, which blew audiences away at Sundance. One of the most entertaining, inspirational, and emotional films of the year. Early bird passes are on sale right now at northwestfest.ca. Can't wait for that. It's going to be so cool. I heard a lot about that Michael J. Fox movie, really. Tearjerker. Tearjerker. We don't talk a lot about the interviews that we don't get on the show. Yeah. Uh, But we tried to get... Been MJ. trying. Yeah, yeah, we tried to get Michael J. You know, from Edmonton, obviously. Yeah. You know, so we like to take credit where we can. We're still working on it, Real Talkers. We'll see what we can swing. Our next guest served Calgarians as a counselor. He wanted to be their mayor and ran a strong campaign, ultimately losing to Calgary's mayor now, Jody Gondek. Since he wrapped up, or at least pressed pause on his political career, he's been doing amazing work, uh, hiking essentially across North America and scaling mountain peaks for a great cause. The guy knows a thing or two about commitment to a cause. It's a pleasure to welcome back to the program, Jeremy Farkas. It's it's nice to see you. It seems like pictures I see of you these days, you've got a pack on your back and a camel back for water and your hiking boots on. How does it feel to have a blazer and a collared shirt on again? You, you know, it's not very comfortable. I, I would trade a, a day in the office for a day out there any day of the week. Yeah, man, you've been doing a ton of amazing stuff, and I want to leave a couple of minutes to talk to you about that. But but why don't we get right to it? It's obviously a huge day in Alberta right now. Uh, you know, by the time that most people listen to this, the, the, the wheels will be officially up on the plane. The plane will be in the air. It's election season. Uh, what are some of the key storylines you're keeping an eye on as someone who's obviously had a lot of experience in politics? Well, I think that there's, there's been this narrative that uh, the election is going to be all about Calgary, but the, the polling right now suggests that the UCP has been able to hold on to what I describe as Fortress Calgary. There's about uh, four to eight seats that no matter what uh, it seems will still go to the UCP. So it starts to put into play some of these other uh, ridings throughout the province, which I think is a good thing. Uh, obviously, as a Calgarian, uh, I love the idea that both parties are going to be trying to buy for my votes and maybe even try to buy my votes. But uh, it's it's important, though, to realize that this election, it's not just about Calgary. It's going on across all the province. And uh, it's, it's just really surprising to me to see uh, which uh, how the UCP has really been able to start at essentially rock bottom after Danielle Smith's re-election. And uh, my sense on the ground here is that uh, for better or for worse, that they've been able to reseize some of that momentum. And uh, the NDP has been caught a bit flat-footed in terms of what their responses have been to several issues where they should have a winning position, uh, not to mention even, say, the arena deal that just came out. Yeah, well, I mean, obviously you and I are going to dig into this arena deal. You've been pretty critical of it uh, publicly. But but let me ask you, what's, what's, what's an area, you just alluded to it, where you think that the NDP should be performing uh, you know, more strongly at this point, uh, where you're mm-hmm. finding yourself a little bit surprised? Well, look at, say, just scandal after scandal, the, even, for example, Danielle Smith, she she refuses to disavow Arthur Pulaski and uh, other issues that they just ke- seem to be continuing to screw up on. And, and this is built, again, based on top of that foundation of the UCP record uh, prior to Danielle Smith, which was pretty dismal. But if anything, I think Danielle has really been able to prove that she's a political survivor. She has political savvy, whether you like her or not. And she's been really masterful as far as being able to change the channel from some of these issues away from areas that the NDP would be strong on. Things like education, uh, diving head, lo- head first into healthcare, for example. So she's been really masterful about uh, seizing that narrative and keeping the NDP on the uh, on the on their back feet uh, really not knowing how to respond to her and and frankly if the if the NDP is not running the board completely by this point based on misstep after misstep from the UCP then I think that bodes really ill for that NDP campaign uh, we're, we're I'm going to be playing this clip a little bit later on when I talk to, to Charles Adler Daniel Smith essentially well I mean she, she's been gushing for quite some time if you're paying attention to the stuff she puts out she makes no secret about the fact she's a big fan of 
of Ron DeSantis, but there's been some audio and some video clips that are surfing, uh, surfacing of comments that she's made in the past year, wondering what could have been done. Alberta partnering with Florida and other red states to to have certain arrangements through COVID and, and shutdowns and, and things like that. And, and, and it's earning uh, Danielle Smith some negative headlines, although it, gets, it depends on who you believe those headlines are impacting or, or who they're reaching. Uh, she's been photographed with some people facing charges. She's been talking to Arter Pavlosky, that kind of stuff. I mean, the recent one was James Bowder, who's facing charges relating to his involvement in organizing that Ottawa convoy. The premier's team says she doesn't know who she takes photos with. Give us a break. 200 people at that event. Bowder himself says, well, she should know who I am. You argue that, (laughs) of course, every convoy organizer believes that the premier should know who they are, but I digress. That's a different rant for a different day. Uh, You you talk about her political savviness. Some would say that her political career has been defined by, to be quite honest, poor decisions at key moments. Where do you see the savviness? Well, it's the best and the worst. And I think the savvy is in the fact that everybody is talking about the things that she wants to talk about. We're talking about the arena deal. We're talking about the Sovereignty Act. She she did this masterfully to be able to have a really come from behind win at the UCP leadership race. And uh, she was all but written off after the, uh, the floor crossing in uh, 2015. And the fact that she was able to do this, to spend her time in the wilderness, to, to really get a sense of what, uh, I'm not going to say what, everybody is thinking but to get a sense of what the people or rather the people who are motivated are thinking identifying those folks and getting them out so the point i think from the start is that she hasn't tried to be representative of every single albertan she's tried to be representative of the people who get off their butts and they will vote in either a leadership by a membership and to vote on election day so i think uh, it's a mistake to see it as missteps when every step of the way she's been really strategic in terms of which group she's trying to cater to how she's trying to build this coalition and I think when we're right now, just on the based on the people who I'm talking to, reluctant conservatives, a lot of fatigue in the community, I think that this is shaping up to be a very low voter turnout election. And uh, we'll have some political science profs that we could ask, and I'm sure you have a Rolodex, but there are very few examples of a low voter turnout election that is also a change election that kicks out the incumbent. Mm. So I think uh, based on just the, the inertia, the fact that they started at such a rock bottom and they're just crawling themselves <laughs> out of that, that shows that the UCP has the momentum. Whether you like uh, Danielle Smith or not, whether you agree that she's politically savvy, I think everybody can recognize that we're talking about the things that she wants to talk about. You were never afraid to, to act as somewhat of an outlier on Calgary's council. You certainly had a strong voice on that council. You staked uh, to a certain degree your political future on it running for mayor. So I'm not surprised to see you call out mm-hmm. some of your fellow colleagues, but you asked them in a tweet on April 28th how they can, quote, possibly justify this arena agreement, this new arena deal. Everybody's talking about it, but I'm not sure how many people actually have have taken a a look through the available information or have a clear understanding of how it's structured, let alone what the implications will be. Why are you so baffled by this agreement? What do you not like about the arena deal? Well, but before I provide my commentary, I, I would just say, yeah, it's it's personal. I, I, I lost the election, but it's personal, not in the way you might think. So the people that I think the, the mayor, council, they're trying to cater to, they're going to drop her like idiots the very instant that they're no longer useful to them. And trust me, I learned that the hard way. And I think that regardless of my criticism, it's more uh, accurate to say, I think we have to rally behind or pressure the city council to get us a reasonable deal. And if I were to guess, I think council's feeling a lot of heat right now for things like transit safety, defunding the police, as well as some of their past decisions, like one day declaring a climate emergency at the and the next, allowing unprecedented uh, new development. So I think uh, they really are desperate for a win, anything, any deal at any cost. And, and they're so desperate right now to hitch their wagon to Danielle Smith at what was really just a, a very transparent uh, UCP campaign event. And given how I would argue inept the NDP has been in the response, the fact that they can't take a look at, say, city taxpayers in Calgary going from being more or less equal partners and getting our money back 
to now CSEC is going to put up 5% of the upfront costs in order to collect 100% of the revenue. It's just, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous uh, what has been agreed to. But again, to be crystal clear, I'm not trying to crap on Gondaka so much as to encourage folks to give her the pressure and the support she needs so that she and council have no choice but to get us a reasonable deal. And I'll remind folks that, of course, uh, you don't want the arena to be an election uh, issue. But if you look at uh, 2017, when we had an embattled mayor, Mayor Nenshi, he was a candidate at the time, and uh, he went up to bat against Bettman, uh, against the NHL. And he said, sure, I want a deal, but not a deal at any cost. When he went up to bat for taxpayers, taxpayers rewarded him with another ter term. So I don't necessarily think that this is the slam dunk that the UCP thinks it is. But given that the NDP have just been really, really weak in their response, not telling us if they're for or against it, uh, I think that uh, it by default becomes a Daniel Smith win. The NDP is in a really tough spot, though, right? Because if, if, if I mean, I, I think it's I mean, I think it's like the best and worst of politics at play. You know, I mean, I, I would never believe anybody with a straight face that said the conservatives don't intend or don't want for this to be an election issue, because, of course, it is. It obviously is in what's expected to be the most hotly contested battleground in the entire province but at the same time i get why you'd want to distance yourself a little bit on the ndp side of course you can argue against stuff like public support or public funds for a private enterprise you can argue against the premise of making available hundreds of millions of dollars for a billionaire who's made a fortune of course but the last thing you want is to be spun or characterized or painted by your opponents as an enemy of of not just the arena deal but of the Calgary Flames, of hockey, of the history of that sport in that very important Canadian city. You know what I mean? You don't have to try too hard to really torque an argument against the NDP if they were to come out in absolute opposition to a project like this. Yeah, and I, and I think that uh, our mayor and council have just given Daniel Smith such an incredible, beautiful gift you have all these left-leaning councillors giving out quotes that the UCP war room is now retweeting. It's actually, it's incredible to see how a, a mayor who had campaigned on standing up to the UCP is now Danielle Smith's main sword and shield in, in a major urban centre like Calgary. But I think that the worst thing is to not take a position. You know, either way, you're going to take heat. But the fact that uh, you choose to be both for and against it, that gets you all the downsides from everybody. And look no further than, say, Jason Kenney. I think that uh, he had a lot of political savvy. But ultimately, through, say, COVID, he couldn't really articulate whether it was for lockdowns, against lockdowns, or for public safety, or uh, against these health measures, right? So the fact that he tried to be all things to all people simultaneously really lost that enthusiasm. And I think that there's a big risk, especially especially for that NDP base of support. When you think about uh, the crumbling education system, issues in the healthcare system, the fact that rents alone went up 25% over the last year, the fact that uh, they need accountants to uh, look at whether or not <laughs> paying for 95% of the thing and getting 0% of the profits, the fact that they need accountants to be able to determine whether that's a good deal or not is a bit ridiculous to me. So I think that if they came out against this deal, I don't think that they have to say we're against any deal, but we're against the terms of this one. Or even if they were to support it, then you know what? I think a lot of people would be willing to get on side and say, well, with some grumbling and say, well, at least you've taken this issue off the table so that now the NDP can talk about health care, education, these other issues. But the fact that we're going to be talking about the arena deal shows momentum for the UCP coming into the first week, week and a half, so that they'll dominate the discussion on issues that they feel that they're strong on and the NDP won't have a chance. Jeremy, for people that are, that are just like going to be out for a beer with their friends and they want to just be able to have a conversational level of understanding about how this agreement as we understand it to this mm -hmm. point would stack up to or compare to the the agreement that saw Edmonton's ice district developed and, and Rogers place and I mean everybody's I mean I don't mean to rub it in man but I'm just saying everybody's seeing bird's eye view drone shots of of <laughs> you know 15,000 people out in the square at ice district I mean this this is like the plan come to fruition uh, never mind the fact that people are getting stabbed and shot down there I digress that's a, that's a whole other storyline but but generally speaking you know more than two billion dollars in development permits issued obviously a ton of investment and the, and the security of the Oilers 
in Edmonton uh, for the next couple of generations, which is obviously big. I think that the arena deal in Edmonton has proven to be a success. There are still detractors. There are still people that on principle will hate it forever. Uh, but I think the success of the project and, and I think that the way that the CRL, the, the levy and everything is paying itself back has proven to be a good formula. How does Calgary's new deal, as you understand it, stack up against Edmonton's? What are maybe the biggest similarities or, or maybe a key difference? Well, it's a bit of apples to oranges, but the biggest thing is that uh, right now we're debating swapping out our, our current old arena with a new one, a slightly or significantly better one. Whereas uh, uh, in Edmonton's case, you're just replacing what was basically nothing, urban blight, and with a brand new facility and a, a ton of new development around that. So the the level of difference before and after was massive in Edmonton. Whereas right now with the Saddle Dome having been there so long, we already have sort of the restaurants and the districts around it. It's not performing as well, but the idea is with a new building, it's going to spur all that investment who's to say if that's actually accurate uh one thing in edmonton the way that it was financed was as you uh, alluded to with the community levy sort of the, the taxes that were collected in the area were the ones that were going to be going to pay for uh the facility in the area whereas in calgary's case it's every single property taxpayer it's uh, upwards of about 800 million dollars in terms of the uh, public contribution and it's a little bit worse than that because in calgary the city will now also loan the flames more than 300 hundred million dollars to be paid back at a very nominal amount and this is debt that will weigh down the city's books it'll affect uh, our credit rating uh, possibly increase the city's interest rates when it comes to things like affordable housing building out the green line uh, building anything and everything and in the case of calgary we're not going to get one cent on the revenues according to what's been uh, publicly released whereas in edmonton at the very least i believe it's a nine and a half ticket surcharge that or rather nine and a half percent which goes to the project right so there's uh, a number of different pieces here that make it a bit of an apples to oranges uh, situation but i'm doing the research uh, as it stands but it looks like this here at deal in calgary is probably going to be making history for the largest single uh, public subsidy to any nhl arena uh, in the world a bit of a dubious distinction uh jeremy we're, we're up against the clock but listen I, i'd love to make a commitment to you on the record i really look forward to having you back and we'll, we'll leave more time you don't have to convince me to talk about getting out to the mountains and hiking and and climbing mountains and fundraising and giving back to the community and all that stuff but i will say this uh in the meantime people can follow you on twitter at, at jeremy j-e-r-o-m-y y-y-c and you can learn more about why he was climbing 25 peaks in 25 days and his entire, I mean, your journey, what was it, the Pacific Crest Trail? Can you give us like 30 seconds on that? I mean, that's just absolutely unbelievable what you embarked on. Yeah, after the election, you know, it was tough, but a lot of people reached out to me and they said, hey, we want you to run again. I'll be the first to write you a check. And several people actually handed me a check and they said, just fill in the campaign for premier, for MLA, for MP. And I said, you know what, I'm going to run again, but I'm going to run again for charity. So we uh, partnered with Big Brothers and Big Sisters of Calgary here. Uh, we had targeted $50,000. We thought this was going to be an amazing stretch goal over the next uh, several months. But we actually hit that even before I had started the run Real. Mexico to Canada. So we continue to raise that. And ultimately, we've come in, I think, uh, more than a quarter million dollars, the biggest fundraising event in that organization's uh, history. I went on to do another campaign, 25 Peaks in 25 Days, to raise 25 grand. We blasted past that, I think, doubling what our uh, goals were. But, you know, for me, I, I genuinely think I can make more of an impact uh, using my voice on issues like the arena, other social agencies, nonprofits. And just because I have a platform, I think I have to be responsible with it to better educate folks and and the fact that i'm not running for anything right now gives me the flexibility and frankly the independence to be able to call out whether it's the ucp or the ndp when i think uh, what they're doing is not good for calgarians or albertans yeah it's got to be a liberating feeling but also i, I bet you i bet you miss the, the dust on your boots a little bit hey yeah <laughs> it, at city hall or in the yeah <laughs> yeah it's no oh yeah i guess yeah that's right i wasn't i was uh, no I, that's right i kind of ran myself in there with with conflicting or competing metaphors didn't i, I was talking more cowboy boots than hiking boots but yeah <laughs> there you go that'll be the book title right dust on the one boot to the other you could do the whole jumping off point I'll leave that to you to figure out. It's not my strong I, uh, I, point, you know. I do just want to close on emphasizing again. I think we need to pressure. We need to support Mayor Gondek and Council so that ideally they can get us a good deal or, or worst case, one that just doesn't suck so bad. <laughs>
<laughs> counselor, former counselor, Jeremy Farkas. We'll get you back on the show soon. It's nice to see your face. Yeah, thanks so much, Ryan. Yeah, appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Dwayne Bratt, political scientist, doesn't love this deal. We're going to find out why, though. He's on principle, he doesn't hate the arrangement, but I'm not going to put any words in his mouth. He's more than capable himself. Charles Adler locked and loaded as well in this Alberta politics super episode of Real Talk. Hey, it's May 1st, which means, of course, the first of the month, every month at Friesen Brothers, it's 15% off grocery purchase of 75 75- dollars or more from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. It means that our family is going to be there at our favorite Friesen Brothers and families, Albertans at 16 different locations will be doing the exact same thing. 15% off is a big deal and Friesen Brothers, of course, knows that. They know that families right now are trying to make the most of every single dollar they earn, but they don't want to cut corners on quality or nutrition. Take two seconds today to check out their website, Friesen.com. That's F-R-E-S-O-N, including the Family Essentials Flyer. We love it. Quality food for low prices every day, including today, the first of the month, 15% off at Friesen Brothers. Also wanted to give a big shout out to our friends at Eden Landscaping. You can find them online at landscapeedmonton.ca. Every once in a while, we get a personal experience that we get to tell you about. And, And I think... As a matter of fact, I know that it means a whole lot more when we say this was our experience working with this team, and this is why we can recommend them to you. Eden Landscaping right now is helping us reinvent our outdoor space and our most important space as a family, our home, our dwelling. It's our biggest investment, but we know that we want to be able to use the outdoor space more than we do right now. So we've given Mike and his team a list of our top priorities, what we value the most in the project, and then of course, probably like a lot of you, a budget as well. The hard reality of the bottom line and watching their team work within that budget to work their magic is amazing. I can't wait to show you the before and after shots later into the spring and summer. That's the partnership that we're proud to have with Eden Landscaping at landscapeedmonton.ca. And if all this talk about spring and new beginnings has you thinking about your own life, Maybe it's your own career or or just your personal development. Why not take some time today to invest in yourself by visiting AthabascaU.ca. Athabasca University is Canada's open university with world-class accredited online programs and courses that offer you the flexibility to learn at your own pace on a schedule that suits your lifestyle. Athabasca U is designed to fit your life. That's right, and they're sure to have something that meets your needs. You can get a Canadian education online with AU no matter where you live. And if you subscribe to our weekly email by way of our website, you already know that Athabasca U's Dr. Josie Oje is going to join me on Thursday of this week. Really looking forward to hearing more about her new podcast on Indigenous people involved in research and planning and how cultural awareness needs to contribute to that process. I'm expecting a great conversation with Dr. Oje from Athabasca University. Well, our next guest on this Alberta Politics Super episode, no stranger to political commentary, in particular when it comes to election campaigns. I've had the pleasure of sitting beside him on some election desks over the years. It's a pleasure to welcome back to the show uh, Mount Royal University's Dr. Dwayne Brad. It's nice to see your face, my man. Big day for everybody. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Thanks for having me. Yeah, what's one of, what, what we talked about the arena deal with Jeremy Farkas, and I want to talk to you about that in just a little bit. But zoomed out, big picture on day one of these election campaigns. What's one story that you're really following with a keen eye? Well, just the biggest theme that you can have. This will be, I believe, the the closest election in Alberta's history. We don't have close elections in this province. Um, since 1905, we've never had a minority government and we're not going to have one here, but we've also never had a situation where the first place party, uh, had less than a 15 seat advantage over the second place party. Okay. So think about that, a 15 seat gap in over 120 years, that's not going to happen this time. It'll be much more narrow. Now that doesn't mean we haven't had competitive races, uh, in 2015, um, you know, I was looking this up uh, when the writ was issued. Wild Rose was leading in the polls at 31 percent. The NDP was at 28 and the PCs were at 27. 
the final uh, vote percentage was Wild Rose 24, NDP 44, PC 25. So the, the while the result wasn't close, it began very close. In 2012, um, Wild Rose was leading for most of the campaign until virtually the last weekend of the campaign, but the result wasn't close. I believe this result will be anywhere from one to five to six seat difference between the winning and the losing party, which is why I'm just as interested in what happens the day after the election and how we govern this province as I am on, on May 29th. If, if, if the ballot box question in 2019 uh, or if the ballot box issue, if it came down to one issue and if that was a referendum on the carbon tax, as Jason Kenney described it then in, in March and April of 2019, what's the what's the one liner? What's 2023 about? What's the number one thing that it's going to come down to? Rarely do you get a single question like that. Uh, and, and this election is currently not. It's really going to depend on an individual, what they believe is the most important issue, because there's a variety of issues out there. 2019, um, when I talk about non-competitive elections, I, I believe that election was, was won and lost a year out of 2019. That's not the case here. So yes, carbon tax, jobs, economy, pipelines. I mean, you could put it on a, a lectern in 2019 as, as Jason Kenney did. I don't know if there's room on a lectern on that. Is it going to be about affordability? Is it going to be about health care? Is it going to be about trustworthiness of, of the leader? It It's still too early to tell if one single issue is going to dominate. And there may be very well differences in what that issue is a uh depending on which riding depending on which part of the province that you you live in uh, I, I will lazily characterize the perspectives of the takes of, of today's first two guests but by saying that dr jared wesley on the new calgary arena deal is not convinced that politically it's going to land in the way that daniel smith hopes it will and jeremy farkas former counselor just thinks it's it, it's a bad deal uh, generally speaking, he, he wants to know how his former council colleagues can live with themselves, basically. Uh, you went on, you said, tweeting on April 27th, for people that want to check it out, at Dwayne Brath, that you're not in, you're not opposed in principle to public money going into an arena. So take us into why ultimately you say that you can't get behind the deal. What is it? Yeah, so I don't, and so a bit of background on this. Um one of the research areas that I've dabbled in over, over the years has been around uh, sport policy. And so I've been in books where I haven't written it, but colleagues have on the economics of pro sports and of new facilities and, and new buildings. And uh, in addition, the old Calgary Next project, which emerged, you know, 2015, 2014, that was going to have a new football stadium and uh, and a new hockey rink and a bunch of other stuff, a field house out in the west end of, of downtown. Um, I was part of a course that did a case study on that. So I do have some background in this. And economically, all of the stuff about it creates economic stimulus and, and revitalization None of that really stands up to scrutiny when you examine uh, the the data. Um, what you that doesn't mean that certain people don't benefit, that certain businesses don't benefit, that certain parts of a city don't benefit. But you're basically diversifying um, um, profits from one part of the city to another part of the city. So if there was no downtown ice district in, in Edmonton, people would still be going out to eat and they would still be going to, to bars. Uh, they'd still be doing entertainment. They just wouldn't be doing it in that district. So I don't buy a lot of the economic arguments, but I think there's a lot of non-economic arguments out there. I do think that it contributes to civic pride. And I know people will, will scoff, uh, but you, you watch, as particularly when teams go through playoff runs, just the enthusiasm that you get into, uh, into a city. Um, you see the parades when teams uh, win. Um, you see, you know, it's similar to the Calgary Stampede, you know, that, that creates a, a civic boost. 
So I see that as a benefit. And and those benefits I can see is why you would put public money in, even if there's private ownership. Likewise, if you're going to have a big city, you need amenities of a big city, whether those are libraries, whether those are parks, whether those are symphonies, whether those are theaters. So in principle, I am not opposed to putting public money into uh, an arena for an NHL team, even if there are private interests that also benefit. Uh, you know, we have public-private partnerships when we build roads and schools, for crying out loud. So the question is, what does the deal look like? And this deal, I believe, is hampered in two ways. The first is it is so politicized. Absolutely, it's politicized. The very fact that they had the announcement days before the writ was issued shows how politicized it was. The fact that Daniel Smith in the uh, announcement said, well, it still has to be approved by cabinet, still has to be approved by treasury board. We're not going to have those details for another six weeks. Uh, it requires the UCP to be reelected. You can't get any more political than that. Um, and so uh, I do wonder about Calgary City Council because they passed this unanimously. How much of that vote was, we don't want to leave $330 million of provincial money off the table? Because you may recall, Ryan, the Edmonton rate did not get that sort of provincial funding. Nope. There was provincial money, but in but no new money. And I think that is what is different here. So the politicization of it makes me very worried about the deal because it was rushed. Murray Edwards did not become one of the 30 richest men in Canada by being a bad negotiator, yeah. a bad businessman. And so he knew that Smith had a deadline of today to get this done. And so if one party has a deadline and the other party doesn't have that deadline, you know, the negotiating uh, hammer is in one side or the other. 100%. And then finally, as, as Jeremy Farkas has revealed, more and more details are starting to come out about the structure of this project and just how good it is for the flames there was a deal in 2019 it ended up getting collapsed but the flames are better with this deal than they were with the previous one they're paying less as a percentage they're paying less um in absolute terms even though the project has doubled and they're getting almost all of the economic benefits not just with the with what goes on in the new saddle dome but now we're hearing land options, sole source land options around the rink. And that's really valuable, as you saw with the ice district. Yeah, we should we reference some reporting here by Jason Herring as well from a few days ago in the, in the Calgary Herald. Uh, Flames owners getting options on commercial parcels, on bus barn land uh, as part of that arena deal. And, and, and a lot of uh, Alberta-based journalists are doing really great work on this. Uh, let me ask you this uh, in, in closing, Dwayne. Like, ultimately, could this be something – well, uh, this can I let me ask you a two part question. Number one, uh, I know you're a political scientist, but let me ask you to be a political strategist for a second. If you were advising Rachel Notley on this, it's just as dangerous uh, to come out in, in criticism of this project as it is to come out in support of it. And for different reasons, obviously. Oh, absolutely. So how and do you manage it if you're Rachel Notley? And that's why in the first day or two, I was wondering how the NDP would come out on this. Uh, they're already, we know that Calgary is the battleground uh, in, the, in this election. And we know the NDP has an issue in Calgary. And so coming out against the arena, I think would damage them here, no matter whether the deal was good or whether it was bad. Likewise, if they'd come out and simply rubber stamp this, this would have also been a problem for the NDP. But what they did is come out and say, we don't have enough information um, to, to make a determination, which was probably the best possible strategy for them. Yes, you could be called waffling, but since that first press conference with Gondek and Smith and, and Bean from, from the Flames, more details have started to emerge. And in fact, in interviews with city councillors, they said, yeah, there's other stuff we, we simply can't say and hasn't been worked out yet. So the NDP is, is trying to play both sides and they're trying to thread the, the, the needle on this. Uh, that is a risky strategy, but so is Smith's strategy. Uh, it's almost like 
Um, you know, this was her big idea, her big project. And there was an initial enthusiasm for it. But it may also be one of the situations that as more details come out, support for that starts to crater when they realize where the benefits uh, go. And we saw this with the Olympics plebiscite in Calgary. We also saw this with the original Flames deal in 2019. When that came out, it was announced in late July, just before city council went on holidays. And it was designed to be done so opposition couldn't coalesce. But if you're going to make it an election issue, that's the danger of it. 100%. Uh, Dwayne, it's so good to see you. And uh, obviously, I know that you and I will be chatting again uh, in short order. It's uh, pedal to the metal for the next 28 days or so. Thanks for making yourself available on day one right here on Real Talk. Okay, thanks, Ryan. You got it. That's political scientist Dr. Dwayne Bratt, uh, a big lacrosse guy, by the way, if you know Dwayne. And, and he had some comments saying that this would be good. That arena deal would be good for lacrosse in Calgary. There's a million different angles on this. We want to know where you're landing on it. Shout out to our live tuners this morning. Those of you that are listening live on the Mixler live streaming audio app presented by California Closets or, of course, in our YouTube live chat. And I've, I've seen a bunch of takes on this, right? Like, you know, Tracy says, for example, we don't necessarily need a new Stollery Children's Hospital hospital in Edmonton. I guess it depends on who you ask, Tracy. Says, but but it was it, that would be candy for those who'd love to see one. We're talking announcements. She said, here again, what will Edmontonians do without? There's only so much money in any budget. You know, it says the arena deal's terrible for the city and for, for Albertans, for that matter. Taxpayers will simply lose something they want more. There's always going to be a consequence. Uh-huh. Alyssa's watching from Calgary, I believe, says Danielle Smith completely overplayed her hand with that stupid campaign announcement, making the city look stupid, doesn't fly here. Ken is right. He says being an emotional hockey market works against Calgary and Edmonton. 100% Ken, right? Talking about who has the leverage. He says when hockey is not tied to a place's heritage, like Seattle or Tempe, Arizona, says you can give a few public dollars for an arena deal that from ken you can send us an email anytime to talk at ryan we're going to get into it uh with you know arguably this show's best friend charles adler in just a second this conversation is presented by the family-owned business the team at grand dog essentials quality raw food I tell you all the time this is what we feed our dogs and uh, both of them i mean including moses at an advanced age 11 years old still looking lean and fantastic so is monroe our lab beautiful girl four years old both of them uh, of course grand dog essentials fed it's delivered to our door it can be the same for you calgary edmonton central alberta and i wanted to let you know put on your radar a new blog post at granddog.ca such a good resource there how to manage your dog's weight with a raw dog food diet you know it's estimated that half of the dogs on planet earth 50 percent of them are overweight obesity can obviously shorten your dog's lifespan their lives are already too short we don't need it shortened anymore make a move toward your dog's best health and best life today by checking out that blog post at granddog.ca the promo code real talk knocks 10 percent off your first time order from grand dog essentials uh, the friends of ours that are always hiring, you know who that is. It's Apex Automation. You can check them out online at apexautomation.ca. Are you a skilled professional engineer working anywhere in Canada right now or even internationally, but you're looking for a change of pace? You're looking for projects that would, I don't know, actually bring out the best in you? You want to realize your career potential? You want to work for a company that puts people over profits? Make a move in the right direction today by checking out apexautomation.ca. They've expanded their locations over the past number of years to be closer to their clients, which means that if you're looking to work in Edmonton, Calgary, Lloydminster, Saskatoon, Vancouver, Bonneville, I mean, these are field offices that are opening so they can give their clients exactly what they deserve. And that is the best connection with Canada's best team in automation. That's Apex Automation at apexautomation.ca. If this summer... John, is it too early to start talking about summer? Do I don't it. think it is. Will I'm you, ready. Well, you texted me. Why don't you? Why don't we tell our friends? You, we were off last week. We we're both attending to some things, and yeah, and 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 you sent me one photo all week long. And what was that photo of, John? 
a double dilly yesterday in the sunshine. <laughs> We're driving by Dairy Queen, the South uh, Ellerslie location. Yeah, okay, yeah. And my wife says, you know, it's a beautiful day. I can't wait for the cold drinks on the patios. And I said, let's start it right now. She enabled you in the best way. The Dairy Queens of Northwest Evident in Sherwood Park want to remind you that every day is a great day to double dilly. Yeah, that's right. It is a verb. Including the Dairy Free Dilly Bars that a lot yeah. of people love. These are the Dairy Queens in Palisades, Nemeo, Newcastle, Westmount, and in Sherwood Park on Baseline Road. They want to let you know as well, the new DQ Summer Blizzard Treat Menu is out. That includes the two new flavors, Reese's Caramel Pretzel and Caramel Fudge Cheesecake. What? Along with the favorite returning lineup, that s'mores, cotton candy, and choco dipped strawberry. Are you kidding you can me? Shove anything in a blizzard. I'm eh? gonna take them all. <laughs> the summer blizzard treat menu is out at the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. And before we get to Charles Adler, I don't know if Adler's gonna be bringing some trash talk to the show today. We'll find out. Usually, you know who brings it every Friday on this show is local environmental services sponsoring. In my mind. The most animated five minutes of media in Alberta every single week. That's right. It's Trash Talk fueled by local environmental services and you, real talkers, who take the time to, well, blow off a little steam in an email to us at talk at ryanjesperson.com. If you're a decision maker for a company or a community in Edmonton, White Court, Regina, or area, you're going to want to check out localenvironmental.ca. Whether it's front load or roll off bins you're looking for, recycling services, it could be landfill services, water hauling, vacuum trucks, fence or portable toilet rentals, you name it. Whether it's commercial, agricultural, industrial, residential, local environmental services does it all. You can find them online today at localenvironmental.ca. Every Monday, it's our absolute pleasure to check in with Emmy Award winning talk radio legend. Charles Adler, who we kept waiting for like 30 minutes in the bullpen today. Hey, the (laughs) campaigns are kicking off, my man. So much to talk about. It's so good to see your face. You are so lucky that I have no ego. (laughs) Because, you know, there are are people, uh, you know, who are like me. I'll just say like me. You know, know, it ain't bragging if you can... I dropped you, you a prove, courtesy okay? text, Adler, and told you we'd there, be a little you know, late I, today. I, I, I appreciate that, but there are there are people with my track record, okay, yep. who will refuse to be the caboose on any train, <laughs> and uh, and I'm the, I'm the caboose today. But all all you know, getting aside, you're, you're the ca- I'm honored. You're the Sorry, caboose. You're the caboose, like Donovan Bailey was the caboose on Canada's <laughs> gold medal winning four by one hundred meter relay team. You're the anchor. You're the no. anchor. <laughs> Listen, I always appreciate getting the baton. And here's the deal. I, I am honored to be following Wesley, Farkas, and Brat. I mean, I'll, I'll be the caboose for you on that train any day of the week. <laughs> okay. Well, let's get into this. First yeah. things first. I mean, and I want to talk to you, obviously, about a lot of the things that are going on and some of the stories that have, that have been making headlines, making news since the last time we spoke. But, but I always like to open on a day like this. I mean, this is the kickoff. This is like the opening ceremony uh, to election season in Alberta. What's one storyline, a key storyline that you're keeping an eye on? Key storyline for me is the credibility, the trust in the leader. Uh, We can talk about the flames. We can talk about deals. uh, We can talk about so many things that have been talked about in this in this super hour. Okay, but the one thing that will stick out for me in terms of recent months, because this campaign began a long time ago. Yeah, I get it. Officially begins today. This campaign began a long time ago. This comes down to a choice. It's not a referendum election. It's a choice election. And the choice is, who do you want to represent Alberta? Who do you want as the quarterback? Who do you want as the captain? Who do you want to lead, Rachel Notley or Danielle Smith? I don't buy this idea that it's either conservatism or socialism. That's just r- ridiculous. And you had several guests making making the case today, especially Jared Wesley, who, if people thought, was a socialist or a progressive, because... He is not for Danielle Smith. I was so proud of the professor from the University of Alberta who said, you know what? The only two membership cards I've ever had, conservative, as in progressive conservative, and UCP. 
And I don't know if you felt the same way as I did, but that added so much credibility to his position because the same crap that's thrown is at Wesley is thrown at people like me. I'm some kind of socialist because I'm not for Danielle Smith. No, I'm either by the, the standards of how things are judged today. I'm either a conservative in Alberta terms. I'm either a conservative or a moderate. And yes, I've supported uh, Notley since uh, the beginning of the year. New Year's Eve, I made, uh, you know, my announcement uh, that I endorse Rachel Notley, not because I'm a socialist, not because I'm a progressive, but because I am rooting for Alberta every day. And Rachel Notley is much more credible, much more stable, much more reliable as a leader. She's got leadership values that are, yes, superior to Danielle Smith. Hey, you probably you wouldn't know this. You would have no way of knowing this. But your episode with us uh, just after New Year's Eve, when you explained to us why you decided to go on the record and endorse Rachel Notley, you know, it's one of our top five most downloaded podcasts of 2023 to this point. Uh, it obviously resonated with a lot of people. I wanted to put a couple of things in front of you. I love that you and I always treat this like like we do off camera when we're just on the phone or lucky enough to go for beers like we did in Toronto a while ago. But, you know, we have a, we have a chance to sort of just like shoot the shit, as they say, casually, Chuck. And I wanted to put this video in front of you. It's it's not new, uh, per se. There's been, there's been a number of videos that have surfaced. Danielle Smith, on the record, she put herself on the record. She wasn't caught on camera. She put herself on camera. Uh, this one, in particular, after she re-entered uh, the political landscape, again, seeking the leadership of the United Conservatives, this about a year ago, where she was talking about, I mean, she, she's made it no secret she admires uh, Florida's governor Ron DeSantis and she wondered aloud she mused about the relationship that Alberta especially through the pandemic may have been able to share with states like Florida here's the context in the interim we can assert some freedom assert that we're going to do things a different way maybe we get a cross-border agreement with Ron DeSantis maybe he has a little zone in Florida that we would be able to fly direct to uh, maybe we can develop bilateral agreements with other free states, uh, red state jurisdictions in the U.S., or even internationally that would allow for us to have a little more autonomy. I don't know, but I think it's worth trying. OK, so th th there's like 30 seconds of the clip. Uh, your thoughts? I don't know, but it's worth trying. Uh, bullshit. OK, you want to you want to trash talk? Danielle, you're, you're, I know you're watching this. You know that that is bullshit when you say you don't know, but it's worth trying. You do know. You're not a country. You're a province. Even though your 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 right hand guy Anderson always wants to talk about uh, sovereignty within sovereignty, he says that Alberta is a sovereign entity within us. That's all nonsense. You're not a sovereign entity. You're Alberta. And Alberta is a beautiful province. And one of the things that makes Alberta so beautiful, it's part of this beautiful country called Canada. Canada is sovereign. Canada can make trade deals with the United States. Alberta cannot. And by the way, let, let's get this Quebec crap out of the way too, Danielle. Quebec also cannot make trade deals because you're always doing this business. About, we just want what Quebec wants. Quebec cannot. Quebec is not sovereign. Quebec voted on sovereignty. They voted against it. So this idea that uh, Alberta can make these deals as a sovereign nation can, you know that that is crap. So this idea when you, when you say, I don't know, sorry, you do know. It's kind of like when you say that you can sue the CBC, you think you have a leg to stand on. Well, rhetorically, I guess you've got a leg to stand on because people support whatever you say. But legally, you can't. And that's why you didn't. In the particular case of the last uh, couple of days, uh, you wanted to talk about how uh, QP right? The Canadian Union of Public Employees, how, how QP might might have a legal problem. You don't know, but it's worth asking. Well, of course, you do know, and they don't have a legal problem. And this isn't me carrying water for the union movement in Alberta or anywhere else. But the idea that QP might have a legal problem because someone working for QP happens to be married to Rachel Notley, you know that there's a charter of rights, you know that freedom of association is protected, and you know that a union isn't going to be in legal trouble, can't be prosecuted, can't be sued because someone who works for them happens to be married to Rachel Notley. So this business constantly that Daniel Smith does about, I don't really know, but it's worth asking. Ryan, I'm going to talk to you right now as a fellow former talk show host. How many times have you seen cowardly talk show hosts say things that they know is not true, but they'll just... Throw in this caveat. I'm just, I'm just asking questions. That airheaded, phony, disingenuous, bullshit remark. 
I'm just asking questions. And that's what that thing comes across as. Now, we can we can talk about the states of Florida and South Dakota, which she says she supports. But let me just ask you, as a fellow former talk show host, how often have you seen that pulled? And how do you feel about talk show, never mind premiers, talk show hosts who say something that they know is bullshit, but add, well, I'm just asking questions. Well, it, 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 Johnny's showing us right now, and for those that are watching this on YouTube, a tweet from uh, former Prime Minister Kim Campbell, former leader of Canada's Conservatives from back in the day, uh, tweeting a, quote, serious wingnut alert, which is, uh, to describe it as candor would be perhaps an understatement, talking about Alberta's Premier, so shots fired there. You know who, when you talk about the talk show host that knows better or that knows the truth, but, you know, it's the one that was leading the headlines last week. Just Chuck, asking it's the, questions. It's the ones, that it, it's, and, and, and uh, Professor Timothy Caulfield's been on the show before, he calls it jacking off. Uh, yeah. Just J-A-Q, just asking <laughs> right. questions. He calls it jacking <laughs> off, which is, which is, sorry, Johnny, for the visual. Sorry for the visual, but... This Chuck, show's got way too much testosterone. I'm talking. I'm t- just wait till tomorrow. We way, got way too much. we got Erica Baroudis and Cheryl Oates to balance good. it out tomorrow. Right. Yeah, that's good right. Stuff. That's that's gonna be a good one. I'm talking about Tucker Carlson. I mean, sent packing by Fox, but this is a guy that's that's built an audience and that will retain an audience. I guarantee it when he moves on to either run for president, uh, where he won't be successful, or to probably go on his own like like we did here on a bigger scale. And I would imagine he'll experience great success. But that was Tucker Carlson. That's been how he. That Tucker Carlson was around for a lot of time for a long time, and he was on networks, you know, like MSNBC as an example. It would be seen yeah. a little bit more maybe mainstream, or a little bit more more reasonable, or a little bit more moderate. But you. You know, when he exploded into fame, Charles, was when he started having the crazier conversations, and there's a huge appetite for it. So to bring it back to politics, you know, it, it's great. And Real Talk will continue with fact checks, and, and you'll bring it every single Monday here on the show. But the average voter, Chuck, all they hear is Ron DeSantis. And if they're wired a certain way, they know that they like that. Or if they know that the premier appears to be open to thinking unconventionally about some certain things, that's going to resonate with them, whether it's realistic, whether it's an actual option or not, right? I mean, that's that's sort of the dark underbelly of political campaigns is that so much of it is 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 not real. Right. Okay. So she says she admires there's two people that she admires most. Remember Don McLean, uh, the three men I admire most, the Father, Son, the Holy Ghost. All right. Fine. Uh, Great reference. The two people, the, the two people, the two people that she admires most. She says are Christy Nome, South Dakota, and Ron DeSantis, Florida. You can bring Caulfield on this. You can, you can bring in a number of people. They can they can bring the stats. I don't do. Uh, uh, you know, data and, and quote professors. I mean, that that's not, that's not what I do. I appreciate those people who do that. That's not what I do. Here's what I can tell you. In both South Dakota and Florida, the amount of people who died of COVID-19, never mind just the, the people who got sick, okay? The people who died two to three to four times, depending on how you look at the data, higher than the people in Alberta. So if you want, if, if, if you want to take Danielle Smith literally, and uh, suggest that you want Ron DeSantis and, and Christy Nome's kind of public health values, okay? You are talking about many more people in Alberta dying. I'm sorry. The number one job of a premier, the number one job of a prime minister, the number one job of a mayor, the number one job of a police chief is to prevent people from dying. If you can't, if you can't get that done, I'm really not interested in everything else you have to say about all your ideological nonsense. Ron DeSantis's policy and his so-called little bastion of freedom, as Danielle Smith calls it, that little bastion of freedom is a coffin. And I vote for freedom, real freedom, not freedom. I vote for real freedom. And the most important freedom that we have is the freedom from fear. And that means you require government. You require public health values. You require public safety. You don't require this nonsense. I agree with you, Ryan. It, it, it pushes buttons. But the button that is pushed for me is the button of, I'm going to roll the dice on people's lives. I don't roll dice on people's lives. Danielle Smith does by saying that she agrees with DeSantis and Noam. That's precisely what she's doing. And by the way, Take Back Alberta is going to be the most important faction of the government. I think that in the next couple of weeks, that'll become more and more clear to people. And Take Back Alberta is totally Ron DeSantis and Christy Nome. Take Back Alberta is no public health care values. 
in the name of what they call freedom. Yeah, you were, you were talking about, I mean, connections to take back Alberta. I think most people, especially regular audience members on Real Talk, will know who the PAC is, who the, the Political Action Committee is, who the group is, anyway. is a grassroots organization that's been taking over the UCP board big picture and also a lot of the CAs, right, these constituency associations, and they're putting a big stamp of influence on the party and, and not in a mainstream kind of a way. Now, there has been a line drawn. Now, here's the segue. Uh, to uh, a southern Alberta mayor, uh, Charles, you and I talked about her a few weeks ago, Chelsea Petrovic, uh, who was talking about whether or not uh, heart attack survivors, some of them need to take more personal accountability. We got some really interesting feedback from Real Talk audience members after those conversations. But here's the deal. There's an update on that candidate. A post uh, from just a couple of days ago, and we'll show it to you here. For those of you that are watching on YouTube, it's it's an interesting one. It's kind of an unusual one, Charles, because it's it's damage control maybe before the damage has been done, in a way, it's it's almost like this candidate is anticipating something pretty significant coming out. And so she posted this on her Facebook, talking about social media posts from past. This is interesting. I want to read this for people listening on the podcast. This from the candidate, quote, with the provincial election campaign uh, about to officially begin, I want to offer this statement. Now, if you're Googling what she's talking about, you're not going to find anything yet, But she says, as someone who's used social media since I was a teenager, I have many old social media posts I'm not proud of. Often I use humor to deal with trauma or high-stress environments, and that includes using crude or inappropriate language. As someone who had no intention of ever seeking public life, there are some comments and posts that I now know I should have been more prudent about before engaging with. I regret not researching some topics over the past 15 years more thoroughly before commenting. She goes on and says, I want to apologize unreservedly for these actions and any hurt that I have caused. I pledge to the residents of Livingstone McLeod that moving forward, I will communicate in a way that is respectful. She says, thank you for your continued support in your service, Chelsea Petrovic. Now, typically, you'd look at something like this and and describe it as a positive development. Uh, Who can't relate to saying or posting or putting out some pretty dumb stuff as a as a young person with with not the level of you know awareness or empathy that maybe we should have who can't relate to eating a little crow or to apologizing for something and who can't respect getting out ahead of something before it becomes a thing but it begs the question what is she talking about and will the apology suffice what do you make of this story well, first of all, uh, just to give context here, she's she's one of the nurses who didn't want to get uh, vaccinated. Yeah, that's right? right. Okay, that's how she got started in all this uh, political stuff. So she's a, a take back Alberta kind of uh, uh, kind of candidate. Um, I, I I don't know whether take back Alberta will want to continue to endorse her if 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 these posts and she'll say they're from a long time ago, but they may have been from from days where she was still an adult. Um, I don't think she's talking about posts when she was you know eight years old. She'd probably be an adult. And uh, if those posts uh, have to do with uh, bigotry against religion, take back Alberta might might not like it. Uh, if their posts uh, having to do with uh, bigotry against uh, perhaps uh, the, the Muslim religion, uh, some people may not uh, like that. If uh, the posts are uh, phobic, uh, transphobic, uh, homophobic, whatever you want to call it, uh, phobic against the LGBT community, uh, some people may not like that. But there's no way that she's putting this message out unless she was ashamed of what she was saying as probably a young adult and the people can make up their own minds in that writing. Of course, this could cause another lake of fire kind of issue for Danielle Smith, a, a severe bozo eruption in which uh, she is given the choice, Danielle Smith, uh, to say uh, whether or not she wants this candidate uh, to have have her support. She can she can do what I I, I think is the civilized thing to do, which is uh, the kind of thing I told uh, Kennedy to do in the last campaign. uh, And I said, you know, you can say this person doesn't represent uh, UCP values, doesn't represent Alberta values, doesn't represent my values. It's a democracy. You can vote for this person if you like but I'm not putting them in cabinet and I'm not even going to put them in caucus. Now, Danielle Smith can say that to try to try to help herself if that's where this is going, but uh, we shall see what we shall see. What do you suppose those posts, if, if she's this is shame preemptively, what do you suppose those posts might be about yeah, categorically? Like, and, and, and again, and like I don't want to ask you the, the question that asks you like to speculate specifically about what it's 
about because, I mean, it's, it, it could be, you know, one thing that's completely different than what we talk about, and I don't want to act like I have insider knowledge or I've seen No, I, I don't I have insight. I'm just saying that all when I'm people saying, are ashamed, generally those are the categories. They go, you know, it's generally, uh, pho- uh, you know, phobic stuff, and, uh, you know, homophobic stuff generally, or uh, it, it's racial stuff. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, and, and the, put, it, put it this it way. Is. Like, if you put yeah. it this way, uh, here, here's what I was thinking about this weekend. Like, if you're a candidate for the party – uh, whose leader has professed an admiration for Ron DeSantis, who is uh, perhaps most well-known in Canada for his don't say gay legislation, for his dust up with Disney, for 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 his uh, essentially, you know, uh, book burning, not literally, but might as well be for anything uh, in schools that might mention gay, lesbian or trans realities, uh, including relationships. If you're a candidate in the party where the leader professes an admiration for that politician, then how bad does the post have to be that you're going to get out ahead of something? I mean, you first of all have to have, uh, the, the, you know, the gut instinct that the post is coming out, that somebody's holding on to something that they're going to hold over your head if they're not doing it already, and that it's going to surface. And you have to believe that it's bad enough that it would hurt your chances to get elected and it would hurt your party's chances as well. So, like I said, uh, in a way, like I want to give credit to the candidate. For, for unreservedly apologizing for something that, that she would take back if she could. I think that that's a positive development in politics. But you have to wonder how bad it's going to be. And I don't know what the subject matter is. And, and quite frankly, uh, with no disrespect to the folks that will be voting uh, in that riding, Charles, I don't know how bad it would hurt her. Like, you know, I, I, I guess we're going to have to wait and see what it is uh, at yeah, we'll this point. We'll have to point. wait and see. But I'll tell you, you just, you just mentioned something that I think is, is worth talking about. Uh, Daniel Smith wants to support uh, Ron DeSantis as someone running a bastion of freedom. Ron DeSantis is best known to many Canadians for his don't say gay business. Can, can we just examine what don't say gay is by simply replacing the word gay? What if what if uh, some governor, some bastion of freedom guy's uh, idea was don't say Christian? Okay, don't don't just th- think about that for a moment. Don't don't say Christian. What would take back Alberta's peace be if that's what they were saying if you want to say don't say gay don't say christian don't say muslim don't say jew what you're essentially doing is you're targeting a group what if someone were to say don't say indigenous don't say cree don't say ojibwe don't say anybody that is related to any of our indigenous nations in this country that's what ron DeSantis does He targets people. That is not the Canadian way. And I'm sorry, I don't believe for a moment that's the Alberta way. One of the best things you had today in terms of the data was coming from Professor Jared Wesley at the University of Alberta. And I don't have the numbers exactly right here because I didn't I didn't scribble them down. But he was essentially saying that there are three groups in Alberta politically, progressives, conservatives and moderates. And they're roughly Ryan, correct me if I'm wrong. They're roughly equal, right? They're all in the same ballpark, yeah. Okay, they're all in the same ballpark. So this idea that Alberta is a Ron DeSantis, don't say gay kind of province, I I get that it gets that kind of torque. It gets that kind of publicity. I get that national media and provincial media will jump on the idea that Alberta is made up of ultra-conservatives and and some, some, some lefties. That's nonsense. It's a third, a third, a third. It's a moderate uh, province. As far as this idea of Alberta being a Ron DeSantis-like province, not true. And that means one thing. And I'll just, I'll 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 detrash this. I'll I'll take the tone right down. I'll I'll evoke a moderate tone. Very well done. what What it means is that Danielle Smith is out of sync with the average Albertan. The average Albertan is not a far right wing, take back Alberta conservative. And so for anyone who wants to be on the other side of Daniel Smith, they don't have to worry that if you're opposed to Daniel Smith, you're opposed to the majority of Albertans. You're actually opposed to a very tiny minority of Albertans. Hey, Chuck, you want to be our locomotive next Monday? <laughs> I, yeah, I, don't, I don't care if you put me at the front, the back or in the middle. I'm always honored to be. At this uh, at this party, it's the it's the best party in town. It's it's the ice district, man. That's oh what this goodness. place is. This is the ice district. Uh, can can we just can we just uh, talk about what what happened? 
the other yeah, night. I, sure. I get technically it happened in Los Angeles, but just t- t- tell me, tell me what that felt like uh, in the ice district on, on Saturday night. Well, Johnny, uh, can you show, you showed a picture of the ice district where we were talking to uh, former counselor Farkas, uh, that, that aerial shot of, of Rogers place. Can you put that up again for the benefit of people that are watching on YouTube? There there was the one, the aerial shot of the arena and you know what I'm getting at. It showed Mercer warehouse as well. So Charles, uh, to, to give you a sense, like we were watching the game on Saturday night. So this weekend I played in the Alzheimer's face off. It's the pro-am hockey tournament to raise funds for Alzheimer's and other dementias. And, uh, so we had a team building event uh, Saturday night, and, and we watched that game here. We were proud to host it at Real Talk at our studio. And for people that are watching on YouTube right now, you see that beautiful red brick historical building right there, kind of kind of in the shadow of Rogers Place. You see that there? That's us. That's the Real Talk studio right there. Nice edit on the fly by Johnny Infamous. Amazing job. So, Chuck, that's where we're watching. So 110-year-old historic building means the windows can still open. So we had the windows watching wide open and we could hear the horns honking and the air horns going and and the cheers and and I mean just absolute euphoria uh, for the Oilers to get through that first round to not take it to seven games I mean ask you know the Boston Bruins how they feel about going to game seven with Florida ask the Colorado Avalanche how they felt about game seven with with the upset Seattle Kraken so I mean just absolutely unbelievable to get that series done to go down to Las Vegas now and to try to move forward uh to becoming the Western Conference champions and ultimately get a spot Connor McDavid's first Leon Dreisaitl's first for that matter Ryan Nugent Hopkins first in a Stanley Cup final. The the fans in Edmonton are not cheering about making the playoffs, Charles. They are chanting, we want the cup. We want the cup, and I'll tell you this. We haven't had, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, once again, I'm counting on you for the fact, 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 fact. Has it been 30 years, it's been about 30 years since uh, Canada has had the Stanley Cup? Uh, the Montreal Canadiens last won it in 1993. The Oilers last won it in 1990. So, so Canadian teams won virtually every Stanley Cup. Uh, in the 1980s, not not technically, the New York Islanders were there in the mix, of course, but 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 Alberta and Canada with with Quebec as well owned the Stanley Cup in the 1980s, and since '93 with the Habs haven't hoisted it since. So this could be an interesting one. Could you imagine people right now in town, especially with the Bruins out, people are talking about now. Can you imagine an Edmonton Oilers Toronto Maple Leafs Stanley Cup final? That would, that would be amazing, and uh, we Westerners have no trouble figuring out what, what side of the pack we're on. All right, so, well, I mean, I'm looking at a situation here, I mean, being co- completely realistic now. For the first time in 30 years, we actually have a good chance, Canada does, of having the Stanley Cup going to a Canadian-based team. And I think it's fair to say, not just because our, our hearts are in Western Canada, that Edmonton, has a fabulous chance of bringing the Stanley Cup back to Canada. That, to me, is worth celebrating, not just in the Ice District, but in every single district of Western Canada. And I hope I could convince my my buds in, in Eastern Canada, where I'm from, that it's worth celebrating there as well. I love it. Charles, we'll talk to you again in a week, my man. That'll be Monday, May the 8th. In the meantime, be well. Thank you. You got it. That's Charles Adler, the Titan of Talk joins us every monday here on real talk are you do you get nervous like i do when when chuck's talking like that and i love it and he's not wrong at all but i get a little bit nervous because i don't want to say i don't want to jinx anything i don't want to say anything i don't i don't like talk after the first round i kind of like shut up yeah because like what about <laughs> like can you believe boston can you believe the boston no Bruins? i told you that was they're winning happen. with 30 I seconds left you. in the game and then florida comes back and wins in an ot like unbelievable you don't you don't get that many good vibes in a season when you win, when you make a record breaking oh, win season like that, I was like, they're gone first round. It's going to happen. And, it, you know, I hate to bring up he who should not be named Kachuk, but that guy is just he is so focused right now. He has that team elevated in Florida. Everyone's doubting them, calling them underdogs. And that's just fueling him. And you see him out there. And I, I know everyone hates him here in Edmonton because he was on the flames, but he, he has lit a fire under them. And I, I'm hard pressed to see them losing until at least at least the conference finals. And uh, but another big one, the Kraken are surprising everyone. And if you look at this team and I'm not a huge like analytics sports guy, but if you look at this team, big, tough, strong defense, very stable, all their forwards, 
fast as hell. And uh, I bet them to win the cup way back at the start of the season. The Seven, Kraken? $17 I put on it because it pays out over 1000 It's Woo! like 1100 And last night, uh, a good friend, <laughs> Andrew Walker, texted me every time they win. He's like, Kraken! With an exclamation <laughs> point. But yeah. those guys are one to watch, too. But obviously, the Oilers, I think I think L.A. was, was their problem that they had to solve. Those guys, especially in L.A., like the ice, it's just so, like, even uh, one of the analysts on TV was talking about it. It's slow. It's mucky because they change it so often. They're used to that slow down, mucky muck kind of play. And when they got in Edmonton, Edmonton just outplayed them. So I I think Edmonton now, and you're going to see McDavid too. One last point. Everyone's like, oh, he's kind of sleeping here. What's going on? Maybe the guy's just saving some energy. Like, you got to go all the way to the Stanley Cup. You think he's just going to break out, get injured or something like that? I think McDavid's going to light it up in the next round. And can you believe how crazy these games in Vegas are going to be with no. the fans going down there? I don't know why you and I aren't taking the show on the road. <laughs> I love, I, you know, this This is for like a little perspective, a little context before we get to what's filling our bucket here with the with Kubi Energy's positive reflections. But real quick, you know what I love is that people are wondering when Connor McDavid's going to come alive. The guy's got 10 points in six games. Like he's like he's he's playing any unbelievable. other player. Uh, any other player that. that would be ridiculous to suggest that he's been quiet to this point. Because he's not getting a hat trick every game. <laughs> he's People not getting are freaking out every game. But yeah, don't you worry about that. It's going to be an unbelievable series. Two very well qualified teams in Vegas and Edmonton. That's a series we'll keep an eye on. And I'm afraid for us. We're right across the street here. Oh yeah. I hope this building stays. Oh, yeah. sound and stable yeah. through all of this hey, you know <laughs> there you go uh, i love that shot you showed of, of mercer right next to roger's place it's an exciting time of year here and real talk scott you covered of course the big games that we'll be talking about uh will of course be over these next four weeks the storylines that develop as part of this election but we'll 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 we'll, we'll throw in we'll mix in we'll sprinkle in a little bit of hockey talk from time to time and that includes this week's edition of of a tradition every Monday, or at least the first episode of every single week, our friends at Kubi Renewable Energy, uh, by the way, they're hiring right now at kubienergy.ca. They give us a reason to focus on the positives, to celebrate the stuff that's really, really filling our buckets. It's our weekly tradition called Positive Reflections. And Johnny, this one is personal. Uh, this one is an opportunity to give a big shout out to the Real Talks audience, uh, the Real Talk audience members, and of course community members that stepped up in support of this year's Alzheimer's Face Off Pro Am. I was so proud to skate on the right wing. Uh, more of a checking role this year for me, John, uh, with the Cali Crush. That's the California Closets team that's led by Captain Cameron Johnson. We had an absolutely unbelievable time this weekend at various venues across the city. All the games played at Terwilliger Rec Center. A ton of teams, a record-setting amount of teams. And, John, I'm thrilled to tell you a record-setting fundraising effort as well. $1.4 million raised for Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia. This will benefit directly the Alzheimer's Society of Alberta and Northwest Territories. We had a chance to hear from their leadership and some of the families that are impacted, not just by Alzheimer's, but also in a positive way by the resources that are available through this valuable organization. This is the biggest single fundraiser, and as they said, the biggest awareness raiser as well, every single year for the Alzheimer's Society. And so I want to give a shout out to the hundreds of participants, the volunteers that made that event go off without a hitch we're talking a big luncheon at the convention center on friday Mm. a draft event at cook county on Mm. friday night games all day saturday a team building dinner event saturday night at hudson's on the south side and then of course games on sunday as well the 50 50 the people that are you know the little jobs john the people that are doing the laundry that are folding the Mm -hmm. towels that are setting the dressing rooms up for the teams that are laying out the chapstick and the sock tape the people that are filling the coolers with gatorade and other stuff every single person that did their part and of course you the donors the people that recognize the value of fundraising like this our hearts are full this week thanks to that huge number 1.4 million dollars raised it wouldn't be possible without support from real talkers just like you we'll be doing it again next year and we thank you in advance for your continued support of the alzheimer's face-off pro-am hockey tournament if you have something that just absolutely made your day made your week something that filled your cup 
Maybe it was a random act of kindness or somebody paying it forward. We'd love to hear about it. Send us an email to talk at ryanjesperson.com. Positive Reflections is proudly presented every week by our friends at Kubi Renewable Energy. Coming up on tomorrow's episode of Real Talk, it's going to be a toe-to-toe partisan debate, but like in a fun way. Erica Baroudi's senior leadership position with Premier Danielle Smith and Cheryl Oates, a senior leadership position with then Premier Rachel Notley. They're going to join me right here live and we'll get into policy and platforms. And of course, we'll be taking your questions. If you enjoyed this episode of Real Talk, please do smash that like button. Thanks to everybody that's subscribing to us on YouTube and on the podcast delivery devices. You can find Real Talk anywhere you get your podcasts. We're back at it tomorrow and every weekday live at 8.30 Mountain Time or later on demand. We'll talk to you again soon. Real Talk is hosted by Ryan Jesperson, Executive Producer Josh Dunford, Technical Producer John Hicks, General Manager Katie Cook Chivers, Account Coordinator Lawrence Durlego, Human Resources Lena Shepard, Website Design Mike Johnston, VoiceOver by me, Carrie Skelton. Real Talk's editorial board is Supriya Dubetti, Ahmed Ali, Brandi Morin, Ann Castleman, Corey Hogan, Harmon Candola. Catherine O'Neill, and Chris Henderson. Member Emerita, Julie Rohr. Real Talk is recorded in Edmonton, Alberta on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional and ancestral territory of the Cree, Dene, Blackfoot, Soto, and Nakota Sioux, home to the Métis settlements and the Métis Nation of Alberta. Real Talk is a relay project. For more, check out ryanjasperson.com.